Aaron is um, now the executive director of the Pacific Whale Watch Association, and that is a 30 whale watch companies, um, 16 in Washington and 14 in British Columbia, um, adhering to regulations and responsible whale watching. So that's fantastic. She grew up in Florida, moved to San Diego, was out on boats there, has gone and kissed gray whales um, in the lagoons of Baja Sur um, four times, and recently just got back, hair's still drying from her time with swimming with humpbacks um, on the Silver Bank off the Dominican Republic. So that's fantastic. So she loves baleen species, but she is working a lot with orcas. And so we are putting her as our resident, southern resident killer whale um, expert tonight. So you'll learn a lot. Um, your heart will be soaring. Your heart will probably be broken and everything in between. And if you have any questions, we're going to do that at the end. So please put them in the chat. So with nothing further, um, I present to you, Erin, take it away. Hi, thank you. What a great introduction. Thanks. Um, yes, as uh, Dareth mentioned, we have a lot of time today. So um, kind of the first half of our evening together is going to be, uh, be me telling you a little bit about Southern resident killer whales, some of the threats that they're facing, what you can do to help them. But then we've got lots and lots of time for questions. And that's really um, what I personally enjoy the most. It's a little bit more candid and informal. Um, so I'm looking forward to kind of the second half uh, of this presentation just as much. Um, before I start my presentation, I do want to give um, a little acknowledgement to the fact that I am, you know, a marine biologist. I'm a whale watching naturalist. I now have this administrative role with the Pacific Whale Watch Association. I am not a Southern resident killer whale researcher. Um, and a lot of the information that I'll be sharing with you today comes directly from people who have dedicated their entire lives to the study of this population. Um, many of them for longer than I have been on this planet. Um, some who are still with us, some who have sadly passed away. Um, but I really just wanna make sure that I acknowledge that this is um, a, a really huge community effort. Um, and I would not be able to give this talk without the work of so many great individuals and organizations. And so I just wanna make sure that that is very clear to everyone watching this talk today. Uh, to get started, to really understand uh, why Southern resident killer whales are so important and unique, we have to talk a bit about killer whales in general. And so uh, let's just cut right to the chase. Let's talk about this big black and white animal here on the screen, killer whales, their scientific name or sinus orca. Um, as far as the size of killer whales, it really varies depending on the exact type that you're talking about. But in general, we like to say they're about 17 to 27, maybe a little bit longer um, feet in length. Uh, the males are considerably larger than the females. So you're Females are going to be in that kind of 17, 18 foot range, whereas the males can get to be 27, 28, even up to 30 feet in length. Uh, weight, same thing. The females will be much smaller. So between 7,000 all the way up to about 25,000 for those really large bull uh, orcas. Lifespan, um, as far as we know, the females live much longer than the males. Uh, females can live to be about 80, even 90 plus years old. Uh, the male's not quite as long, about 30 to 50 years, although I know that we do have a male in our mammal-eating orca population here in the Salish Sea that's currently estimated to be 61 years old, so they can live a little bit longer than that. And then diet, again, it really depends on the type of orca that you're talking about, but varied. Um, there's different types of orcas that eat just about everything, uh, and, and I have a slide talking about that in just a bit. Uh, but I do want to address something before I get too deep into this talk. Uh, I refer to them as killer whales. I refer to them as orcas. A lot of folks don't like the term killer whale, and I get feedback about that. Uh, you know, you should call them orcas. They're not killers. They're majestic creatures. Why are you calling them whales? They're dolphins. Uh, I love addressing this. So um, as far as calling them orcas versus killer whales, a lot of people think that killer whales is you know, really mean and harsh. They don't like that name, but they're top predators. You know, they're at the top of the food chain. They are um, great hunters and killers. And that is absolutely true. Um, but for the folks that think that orcas is a better name or sinus orca is kind of translated to whale from hell, which isn't really all that warm and fuzzy either. So, um, you know, killer whales, orcas, they're really interchangeable. And killer whales are whales. Yes, they are dolphins. They're the largest of the dolphin family, but dolphins are 
toothed whales. And so um, I just like to get that out of the way because I've gotten feedback after I give this talk that uh, people's experience was ruined after I called them killer whales. So I just want to get that out of the way before we get into this. I will probably use both terms interchangeably. Uh, and I mentioned there's many different types of killer whales or orcas around the world. Um, this is a really great graphic from Uko Gordner showing a few of the uh, best known ecotypes around the globe. You can see depending on where they live, they do look a little bit different physically. Um, they have different markings, uh, different sizes, different eye patches. Uh, and things like that. Uh, some in Antarctica eat penguins, some eat other mammals, some eat sharks. Um, it really just depends. They've specialized depending on what niche they fill around the world. So there's several different types. Um, as of right now, they're all the same species or sinus orca. Uh, now where I live here in Washington state, um, we watch whales in a body of water known as the Salish Sea. So when I refer to the Salish Sea today, um, I'm talking about these bodies of water on the left. So uh, once you come in from the open ocean, you have the Strait of Juan de Fuca, which turns down into Puget Sound to the south or up into the Strait of Georgia to the north. And all of those connected waterways are collectively known as the Salish Sea. Um, and we use that term because, uh, you know, for a really long time, laws would maybe apply to Puget Sound or laws might apply to the Strait of Georgia. Well, animals that live in the Strait of Georgia also go to Puget Sound. And so what happens in one place very much um, affects what happens in others. And so having a collective term for these connected bodies of water that affect each other um, was really important. And so uh, this term, Salish Sea, was coined uh, about 40 years ago, but it's just now really starting to catch on. And so um, more and more people are using it every year. But Salish Sea is really the term I like to use because I think it's the most accurate way to really describe the ecosystem that uh, these whales are inhabiting. Um, and again, to appreciate southern resident killer whales, you have to understand a little bit more about the other types of killer whales that we see in this area as well. And so in the Salish Sea, there are three ecotypes or varieties of orca that we could encounter. Um, those are residents, bigs, also known as transients, and offshores. And so I want to start with the ones that we see the least often, which are offshore killer whales. Um, they are actually incredibly rare. I have never seen offshore killer whales. Uh, you know, they show up maybe once a decade, once every two decades or so, but sightings have been documented inside the Salish Sea. They are the smallest of the North Pacific ecotypes. Oops, sorry. Um, they're the smallest of the North Pacific ecotypes. They get to be, uh, you know, just over about 21 feet in length. They tend to travel in really large groups of, you know, 50, 100 animals at a time. They range from Alaska down to Southern California, even kind of um, crossing the border into Mexico. Uh, but as I mentioned, Salish Sea sightings are very rare. And right now it's estimated that there's probably around 300 animals or so in the population. As far as physical characteristics, uh, if you look at, again, these great illustrations from Uko, um, you'll notice that they have um, a kind of faint saddle patch. Um, so it's kind of a lighter gray as opposed to a really stark white. Um, they have dorsal fins that are a bit rounded at the tip, but they usually have lots of nicks in their dorsal fins. Um, and so uh, that's one way to kind of look at them and tell that um, they could be offshores is that they have a rounded tip, but lots of nicks in the dorsal. Uh, and the reason that they might have those nicks in the dorsal is because we know that their diet consists very heavily of sharks. Um, and that's evident if you look at their teeth, their teeth are worn down almost all the way to the base. Um, and that's because sharks have those dermal denticles on their skin. It's almost like sandpaper. And so it, over time, it just wears their teeth down. But other than that, we know very little of offshore killer whale behavior. Um, sightings are rare in the Salish Sea, but honestly, sightings are rare pretty much everywhere in their territory. So we, we just still don't know very much about these types of orcas at all. Uh, and then we move on to the bigs, which were formerly known as transient killer whales. And I know down in California, there's the transient killer whale project um, and other uh, projects like that that refer to them as transients. 
here in the Pacific Northwest, there's been a really concerted effort to switch over to the name Biggs killer whales. And that's Biggs after Dr. Michael Big, who is the researcher who first really determined that there were more than one type of orca or killer whale in this region. Um, transient kind of implies that they're uh, you know, seen very rarely. And the truth is they're, they're seen um, with more and more frequency, which I'll talk about later. But so same population uh, down South, I think you still refer to them very much as transients. Um, but up here for the last several years, we've been transitioning over to that moniker, Biggs killer whales. Uh, and so Biggs killer whales are the largest of the North Pacific killer whales. Um, they can get to be up to 27, maybe a little bit more longer um, feet in length. Uh, they typically travel in smaller groups, um, you know, four to six animals. I do have an asterisk after that because um, as their population grows every now and then we will see larger groups of them, a couple of different families coming together in groups of, you know, 12, 15, even 20 or more animals at a time. So that's not the best identifying characteristic. Uh, as far as range, they go from Southeast Alaska all the way down uh, into Central California, but we do have some uh, even farther South records of big killer whales that we've seen up here in Washington and British Columbia. They've been seen as far South as Ensenada, Mexico. Their physical characteristics uh, are, are a bit different than the offshore. So their saddle patches are much more obvious. So a more bright white color. Um, their dorsal fins are usually more pointed in nature as opposed to the rounded dorsal of the offshore killer whales. But again, because they're hunting things that can kind of fight back, um, they'll usually have a lot of nicks or scars on their dorsals as well. So those are the characteristics that we're looking for as naturalists on the water from a distance. Uh, is it a pointy dorsal? Um, are there a lot of nicks and cuts on, on their bodies and dorsal fins, that kind of stuff. Uh, big killer whales feed on marine mammals, things like seals, sea lions, porpoises, uh, as well as other types of whales. We had a pretty uh, phenomenal minke whale predation event last year that made the news. You may have seen that on social media, um, but uh, usually they're sticking with seals, sea lions, harbor porpoise. That's a bit uh, easier prey item for them in this region. And the really great thing is that we currently here in Washington have a really healthy supply of those prey items. So we've got lots of seals, lots of sea lions. Um, ever since 1972 with the Marine Mammal Protection Act, people stopped hunting seals and sea lions. And just like you've experienced down there in California with pinnipeds making a rebound, we've had a similar rebound up here in the Salish Sea. And so with that constant supply of pinnipeds, they have been really able to reproduce at a staggering rate. Um, there's currently estimated to be about 370 animals in this um, kind of northern coastal bigs population. Um, and that's increasing at about 4% every single year. Um, that number, because I know that you folks um, also have um, kind of the transient killer whales down near you, that number for the most part does not include your California animals. So there are even more than those 370, it's just 370 or so who regularly come into these waters of Washington and British Columbia. Uh, one of the really phenomenal things, especially if you know anything about uh, killer whale life history, is that some of the big killer whale moms that we have in this population are averaging a calf every two to three years. Uh, and the reason I say that's phenomenal is because the gestation period for killer whales is usually about 15 to 17 months. So you're pregnant for about a year and a half, and then in six months or more so, you're able to you know, reproduce um, another calf. It's just really phenomenal. So um, they're reproducing very quickly, again, because they have uh, so much food at their disposal. Last year in 2022, there were 10 new calves reported just in that year alone. So they're doing quite well. Uh, at this point here in the Salish Sea, Biggs killer whales can be seen just about anywhere at any time of year. Um, I included this map on the right more as kind of a, a joke because if you try to figure out where the best place to see Biggs killer whales in the Salish Sea is, there really isn't one. Um, if it's a marine waterway that's accessible by whales, there's probably going to be a Biggs killer whale there at some point in the year. Um, last year, 
Uh, there were more than 1,200 unique Biggs killer whale sightings, according to Orca Behavior Institute. A unique sighting means it's that group of whales throughout the entire day. So there's no repeat. So more than 1,200 sightings um, in uh, just that single year is really phenomenal. So um, those are our sightings last year. And as you can see from this picture, they're really quite urban whales. They're used to being around vessels. They're used to being around um, you know, human activity. Uh, they've just become part of the landscape. Um, and so vessels and whales have really learned to coexist in this area. Uh, and so we've talked about the offshores, talked about the big killer whales. And now that you know a little bit about those cultures, if you will, now I want to talk about resident killer whales because it's really quite different than the other two ecotypes we've talked about so far. Resident killer whales um, are smaller than the mammal eating big killer whales, but they are larger than the shark eating offshores. Um, they'll get to be just under 24 feet or so for those large males. And they typically travel in larger groups. Um, again, and I have an asterisk there because uh, one of the ways we used to tell the bigs apart from the residents was, are they in a small group or a large group? Well, the bigs killer whales are now starting to travel in larger groups. Resident killer whales are starting to kind of branch off and travel in smaller groups. So we don't really use group size very much as an identifying factor anymore, but typically um, they can be seen in larger groups than bigs. They feed primarily on salmon, uh, most especially Chinook salmon, which are the largest and the fattiest of the salmon species that we have in this area. Um, but that said, they do also feed on chum and coho salmon, and um, they've done you know, fecal samples and have found that they eat small percentages of other types of fish as well. But Chinook salmon by far is their preferred food item. Um, as far as identifying resident killer whales, uh, if you look at their dorsal fins, it's kind of a hybrid um, between um, kind of the transients and the offshores. So they have rounded dorsals, just like the offshores do. Um, for the most part, they don't have very many nicks or cuts, um, but every now and then you'll get maybe one or two animals that do. Um, and then as far as their saddle patches, they have, for the most part, what we call an open saddle. So the closed saddle um, of a big killer whale is kind of a solid white saddle patch. But we see with the residents what we call an open saddle, which if you look especially at the female on the right here, um, they have that uh, kind of darker color in the middle. They have little what we call fingers that extend into the saddle patch. It's not a continuous white patch. And so we can spot that from a pretty far distance. And, and that's one of the ways that we know immediately that we're looking at residents is if we see one of those open saddle patches, we know that it's a Southern resident as opposed to a Biggs. Um, now there are uh, different populations of residents. There's Alaskan residents. We don't see those down here where I live. We can see Northern residents. Um, and if you look to the right, the area in red is the typical Northern resident habitat. Um, so they can be seen in the Salish Sea, but usually they're going to be seen more off of the rest of coastal British Columbia up into southeast Alaska. Uh, right now, there's about 310 southern residents as of the 2019 census, and their population is increasing. Um, so that's great news. Uh, I mentioned they range from typically Washington up to southeast Alaska. And then finally, after all of this info, um, we finally get to the topic of the evening, which are the Southern resident killer whales. Um, and the Southern residents, again, if you look to the map on the right, you'll see their range in red. They can be seen in the Salish Sea. They can go north um, along coastal BC. There's even one record of them being seen in Southeast Alaska, and they can go all the way south into Central California. Um, but unlike all of these other whale populations that I've talked about so far this evening, their population is decreasing. And as of the last census in 2022, there are only 73 individuals in the Southern resident killer whale population. And so let's talk about their population structure. Uh, so we talk about matrilines of Southern resident killer whales. A matriline is going to be a matriarch. So an adult female, um, either a mom or a grandma and all of her descendants. So her sons, her daughters, and her grandchildren. And so that kind of core family unit is what we call a matriline. Then if you move up to the next step, you have pods. 
Um, a pod is a group of related matrilines that travel together, they forage together, they socialize, and they even rest together. Um, and so the pod is going to be the next step up on that ladder. And then above pods, you have what is called a clan. And a clan is going to be a group of different pods that all share a similar language or similar calls or vocalizations. Um, and all of the Southern resident killer whales belong to what we call J clan. So there's only one clan when we're talking about Southern residents and that is called J clan. Uh, so as far as that uniqueness of culture that Southern residents have compared to all of these other populations of killer whales, it is thought that Southern residents based on their DNA diverged from those mammal eating bigs killer whales that also inhabit the same region more than half a million years ago. Um, I say 500,000 years just because it's conservative. I've read some sources say, you know, 750,000 years, but it's certainly been a very, very long time. Um, they should, for all intents and purposes, be considered totally different species. And it is my understanding that, um, you know, the powers that be in whale taxonomy are in the process of officially splitting them into two different species. So that will be coming probably the next few years. We're gonna have to you know, rewrite all of our textbooks. But for now, just know that we up here in the Pacific Northwest treat them like two different species. They do not breed with each other. They don't interact with each other. Um, they really are very, very separate. Uh, Southern resident killer whales do not eat marine mammals, even when they are starving. And unfortunately, we will talk about the fact later that sometimes they are starving yet they are not raised by their family to recognize marine mammals as a prey item. Um, you know, they don't associate pinnipeds, for example, as being a food source. And so if they don't have fish, they're not eating. Uh, residents are more vocal than the mammal eating orcas in this area. And the reason for that is that um, you know, mammal eating orcas are eating things like seals and sea lions, which can hear them and associate those calls with a predator being in the area. Residents, they're foraging on salmon and the salmon really don't have that same fear response to the vocalizations. And so we routinely hear residents on the hydrophones in this area. There's a really great network of hydrophones, both in British Columbia and uh, Washington that are publicly available um, for, for you guys to tune into and listen to if you'd like. But we typically will hear residents on the hydrophones far more than uh, Biggs killer whales when they're in the area. Um, and Southern residents, again, they're all members of J clan, which means that they all speak the same uh, you know, language, so to speak. Um, but within the different pods, J, K, and L pod, uh, they have kind of different accents, if you will. They have different dialects. Uh, one pod might use certain calls more than another pod. And so if you're listening to a hydrophone, you should be able to identify whether or not um, it's J-pod, K-pod, or L-pod. I have just a quick 30 second clip. Um, hopefully it works, we ran, ran it through earlier, but some vocal. And so that clip actually comes from what we call a super pod. I believe that was recorded in 2013, so 10 years ago now. Um, so a super pod is when all three pods are together at the same time socializing. And that's when we get really the most interesting vocalizations is when all of those groups are having you know, their big kind of family reunion time. Um, but just know that that language for Southern resident killer whales is unique from Northern resident killer whales, from Alaskan resident killer whales, from Biggs killer whales. They really have a unique language um, that no other whales share, um, which is one of the reasons that they're so special. Oops, sorry. There we go. Um, and so another thing that's unique to Southern resident killer whales 
compared to the other types of orcas that we see in this area is that Southern resident killer whale families stay together for their entire lives. Um, for big killer whales, dispersal is not uncommon. And so this is one thing that was kind of eye-opening to me because I learned um, as a naturalist down in California that killer whales stay with their families for life. Um, and the more that we're learning about Biggs killer whale behavior, um, the more we're kind of learning that that's not necessarily true. That really applies to Southern resident killer whales, but not all killer whales. Um, Biggs killer whales, because they tend to travel in those smaller groups to maximize probably their hunting efficacy. Uh, if a mom has a daughter of her own, once that daughter mates and has her own offspring, typically that adult female with her new calf will disperse and leave the family. So that's one example. Um, males do tend to stay with their moms for their lives. But again, one thing that we've really started to observe in the last couple of years is if that big family is starting to grow to be fairly large. Uh, for example, if you have one mom who has four or five children, once you get to have a big family, that's more mouths to feed. And it's not uncommon for some of those kids to start to wander off. One of the cool things is that it's not always the oldest one that wanders off. Sometimes it's the youngest one that wanders off um, and, and kind of, you know, sets up their own uh, little group or joins another group or things like that. But for bigs, it's much more fluid. They're moving around quite a bit. Whereas the Southern resident killer whales, when you're born to that family, you are staying in that family. You're staying with your mom uh, throughout her entire life as long as she's there. If something happens to your mom, you'll go and travel with you know, other members of your family. Uh, with Southern residents, the matriarchs or the older females, again, those moms and grandmas, they are the ones that are in charge. It is a matriarchal society among the Southern resident killer whales. Um, and they pass down all of that ancestral knowledge and they are the ones that also help care for the pod. So they're the ones who remember which rivers are uh, you know, going to be running at certain times. They kind of lead the way, they make those decisions. Um, they, you know, again, help care for other members of their families. Many of you probably already know this, but killer whales are one of the very few species of mammal that do go um, undergo menopause. And so even when they're reproductively no longer able to have children, they're still very critical to their families by helping to spread on that knowledge and care for the rest of the family. Southern resident killer whales are also known for being very social and also very surface active. And big killer whales, we do see on occasion, they'll be active at the surface. You know, we'll see some breaches or tail slaps from time to time. But again, just like with their language, the big killer whales, because they're hunting things like seals and sea lions that would spook if they were being too noisy or too obvious, they're usually pretty stealthy. So from a whale watching perspective, unless you're actually watching a hunt, sometimes big killer whales can be um, a little bit less exciting. You know, they're just traveling from point A to point B, maybe spending a lot of time underwater looking for food. Whereas Southern residents, because they're hunting salmon, which again, are kind of oblivious to the situation, uh, we'll see a lot more of those breaches, a lot more tail slaps, uh, a lot more of that surface active behavior among the Southern residents. And again, they're very social. And that's not to say that big killer whales aren't social, but Southern resident killer whales, it just seems to be a little bit higher level of complexity with their social interactions. Um, we see a lot of cuddling, the cuddle puddles. You've probably seen pictures of those from local operators up here in this area. Uh, we have things that are, are known as what we call a greeting ceremony. So when you have different pods that come together, they'll interact, they'll you know get really excited, lots of vocalizations, lots of uh, you know, physical touch, things that we just don't see a lot um, with the big killer whales, at least not at the surface. Uh, and so this is fantastic. They're a really amazing population and everyone is in love with them. They're very charismatic, but they're also in a world of trouble right now. And that's what I really need to raise awareness about this evening. Uh, so I mentioned there's three pods that make up the Southern resident killer whale population. Those are J-pod, K-pod and L-pod. And you can see that right now there's 25 individuals in J-pod. Um, K-pod is the smallest with just 16 individuals. And then L-pod has 32 individuals. And this is a really great graph. Um, so the organization that does the annual census for Southern resident killer whales is the Center for Whale Research. And um, if you look at the patterns over time, 
uh, you can see that it's been a bit of a roller coaster for their uh, population. It goes up and down, up and down. They were um, listed as an endangered population back in 2005, um, but unfortunately, since that time, they have still continued to decline. And one of the really uh, very sobering statistics of the Southern resident killer whale population is that up to 69% of Southern resident killer whale pregnancies fail. Um, and we know that because you, know, you can come by and scoop up a fecal sample of a killer whale and find out whether or not it's pregnant. You can fly a drone over a Southern resident killer whale and see whether or not that female has a calf that she's pregnant with. But guess what? A couple months later, no calf. <laughs> and you can put the drone up and you can see that they're no longer pregnant or you can take that sample and see that they've lost that pregnancy. And so whether they're miscarrying or whether they are giving birth to calves that just don't survive, um, again, almost 70% of Southern resident killer whales are not uh, successful in, uh, sorry, pregnancies are not successful, um, which is a huge problem, especially when you compare it to the success of those big killer whales who are just, you know, baby factories cranking out new calves every two to three years. When you look at the pods um, individually, you can see that J and K pod, the yellow and the green, are fairly stable over the years. L pod is the one that really has declined the most. Um, they went from in the mid 90s having as high as 59 individuals, again, down to the current number, which is 32. Now, not only is the overall number of Southern resident killer whales decreasing, but Southern resident killer whales are spending uh, less and less time in the Salish Sea, which was once considered to be really their core habitat. Um, in 2021, Southern resident killer whales were seen on just 103 days out of the year, which was 28% of the year, which was a record low. Um, in contrast, in 2021, big killer whales were seen on 329 days of the year, which is 90% of the year, which is a record high. And uh, one question is always, well, maybe Southern resident killer whales are being pushed out by this increase in big killer whales. And um, that's a really good theory, but the truth is there have been a few occasions where big killer whales have been in the same area as Southern resident killer whales. And it's the Southern resident killer whales, the salmon eating Southern residents, that end up pushing out the big killer whales, which is not what you'd expect, but it is what we observe. And so um, I do not think that's the case. I think that the reason um, they're not here uh, has nothing to do with big killer whales. Uh, this graphic is, is just really a great illustration to show how things have changed over time. So back in 2011, uh, you can see that uh, we didn't see a lot of Southern resident killer whales in kind of the winter and spring, but we saw lots of them in the late spring, summer, and early fall. Uh, and then if you look 10 years later in 2021, it is completely shifted. Uh, you saw them in kind of the fall, uh, early winter, but virtually none of the summer. And uh, some of you may appreciate this because I know a lot of you have come to the Salish Sea to watch whales. And 10 years ago, summer was the peak season. Summer is when you come to watch killer whales in the San Juan Islands. And we still have lots of big killer whales, but we do not see Southern resident killer whales very often in the summer anymore. And we'll talk about why that is in just a little bit. Uh, so how did we get here? How did Southern resident killer whales become an endangered population. Uh, and the first thing I wanna talk about are captures. When we talk about threats to Southern resident killer whales, we don't typically talk about captures because it's not happening anymore. But the truth is, it's a really big reason of why they're in the position they're in right now. And so I think that it does deserve to be talked about. Um, so the capture era started with a particular um, individual killer whale nicknamed Moby Doll. Back in 1964, so uh, you know, think about think about this. Paint the picture. 1964, the Vancouver Aquarium wanted to build a model of a killer whale, and they figured the best way to make sure that their model was really accurate was to go out and kill a killer whale that they could use to make this sculpture uh, and make this model. Um, we would not do that today, but 1964, that's exactly what they did. And so they commissioned someone to go out and shoot a killer whale with a harpoon so that they could drag it back and make this beautiful whale sculpture. Well, the whale did not die. 
And so um, they harpooned the whale, it was injured, but it didn't die. And they decided instead of shooting it again to kill it, they'd haul it back to the aquarium and sell tickets to have people come look at it. Um, and that was the first captive killer whale. Um, Moby Doll lived for just a few months. They kept it in you know, an open sea pen, but so many people came to see that whale and there was so much interest that once Moby Doll died, they figured we gotta get more whales. And it was not just them, it was many different aquariums around uh, the country as well as the world. And all told during this kind of what we call the capture era, nearly 50 Southern resident killer whales and about 20 other orcas were captured for the aquarium trade. Um, it was really heartbreaking, but for transportation ease, calves or very young whales were preferred because they were the smallest. They were the easiest to transport to these aquariums, but you had people specifically targeting the youngest, uh, most vulnerable members of the population. Um, even more whales died during the capture process. It was really brutal. Um, some other whales drowned. Uh, and so all told, um, at least a third, if not more, of the southern resident killer whale population died or was taken to aquariums during this time. Um, and that's a, a really significant um, decline. You're talking about taking you know, 30, 40% of a population. You're removing all of the young whales. So you're taking out an entire generation from the population. And what happened then is all those years later, when those whales would have been reproducing and creating the next generation, we missed that. And so um, they are still recovering from that huge, huge loss that the aquarium trade um, is responsible for. Uh, but today, in 2023, the number one struggle of Southern resident killer whales is prey, or I should say, lack thereof. Uh, I mentioned that they eat fish, primarily Chinook salmon, um, and this is a really great infographic from the Seattle Times from a story that they did a couple of years ago. There's two problems going on right now with salmon. One is that overall, they are decreasing in numbers, and you can look at the comparison in Chinook runs from you know, the 70s till today, and there are about 40% less Chinook salmon now than there were you know, four decades ago, five decades ago. So that's one problem is that there's less fish in general. The second problem is that the fish are getting to be much smaller. Um, over the last time period that we've seen about a 40% decrease in abundance, there's also been about a 20% decrease in size. Um, the picture on the left is of um, what we used to call these June hogs, these massive, you know, 100 pounds Chinook salmon. These don't really exist anymore, but these are the fish that Southern resident killer whales evolved to hunt. Um, you know, it's about the same size as a harbor porpoise, if you think about it that way, um, but they're just not here anymore. And so now, instead of catching, you know, 25, 30 pound Chinook salmon, even some of these 50 to 100 pound salmon, your average Chinook salmon right now is about 12, 16 pounds, um, maybe 20 pounds as this infographic says, but that is um, not typical nowadays. And so what happens is these whales still have to eat, but now they're chasing much smaller fish. Um, and so they're expending even more calories to catch these fish. And actually they have to expend even more calories because they have to catch more fish to meet those caloric requirements. And so what you have happening is that they're in a caloric deficit. Um, a very recent study, um, which is a great study because it looks at 40 years of salmon abundance and killer whale um, health is that uh, they found that Southern resident killer whales have been in a caloric deficit for at least six out of the last 40 years. And they estimate that they're getting about 17% fewer calories than they need, um, which is equivalent to us as humans skipping breakfast every day. So imagine if you know you were used to eating three squares a day, and now you only get two. You know that's going to have an impact on your health. This image comes from uh, a group SR3 who does a lot of drone photography work in this area to assess body condition. Um, this is a whale, JA27 Blackberry. Many of you may have heard of him. Uh, on the left is from 2018. On the right is from last year in 2022, and you can see that his condition is. Um, more thin than it was a few years ago. So you can see that 
the area um, in his rostrum, his face um, has gotten much more angular, more pointy, his body overall is much more slender. Um, and so these are the types of things that researchers are looking at when they're trying to determine body condition is, you know, they have all these formulas and measurements of, of you know, different proportions, but just by looking at them side by side, you can see that he's thinner now than he was a few years ago. Uh, if there's any doubt as to what the relationship is between salmon abundance and southern resident killer whale uh, mortality, this graph should, uh, you know, be the final nail in the coffin, so to speak, to convince you. Um, this is a really great representation made by Jane Kogan and the Center for Whale Research. Um, it's a bit complicated, so I'll just kind of explain the gist to you, which is that the purple bars on top are southern resident killer whale mortality. So if the bar is very, very short, or if there's no bar at all, it means that no whales died that year. No southern resident killer whales died that year. If the bar is very big, it means several southern resident killer whales died that year. If you look at all these colorful lines down at the bottom, you'll see that these are composites of a bunch of different uh, rivers, a bunch of different Chinook salmon runs. And so combined, you can see all these peaks and valleys. And when you overlay the two of them, it's very obvious that in years when you have lots of salmon, the mortality rate for southern resident killer whales is very low. And in years when the salmon runs were dismal, the deaths in the southern resident killer whale population were very, very high. Uh, and again, it's just a perfect illustration that I like to show people when they, you know, are just really trying to figure out the mystery of why southern resident killer whales are dying. Duh, they don't have enough to eat. Uh, but there are some compounding factors. So prey, always, always, first and foremost, um, I make sure that that's known, but there are some other complications too. And one of them is pollution. Uh, so many toxicants that we have in um, our waters are fat soluble, which means that they're stored in the blubber. And so what happens is as you work your way up the food chain, um, the higher up on the food chain you are, the more of these toxicants you're absorbing and accumulating, and they're just getting packed away, packed away in your blubber. Now, females, um, because they make calves and they nurse those calves, they actually have a way to offload some of those toxins. Um, and so um, females, uh, even though it's really bad news, especially for a firstborn calf, because that firstborn calf is really getting a huge load of mom's toxins, but females have a way to get rid of some of those um, toxicants that they're accumulating in their body. Males don't. Males don't have calves. Males don't nurse. So their contaminants are just piling up, piling up. And we do think that's a reason, if you remember back to you know, one of my first slides, I said that the males don't live nearly as long as the females. That's probably why. The males are much, much more contaminated than the females are. Um, but as I mentioned, those toxicants are stored in the fat. And so what happens is once your body is breaking down that blubber, if you're not getting enough to eat and you have to tap into those food stores, that's when the chemicals are entering your system. That's when they're getting broken down and when it becomes problematic. Big killer whales, the ones that eat marine mammals are even higher up on the food chain than Southern resident killer whales are, which means they actually have even more contaminants in their bodies. But because they are eating so much, they never have to dig into those fat stores. So they're really, really polluted. It's not a good thing. Um, we have to address this. But because they're not tapping into those fat stores, they're just building up and building up and building up the contaminants, but they're not breaking them down in their bodies. And so it's not as much of an issue for the mammal eating orchids in this area. Um, these are just some headlines I took from stories that have come out in the last few years to show you what a problem this is. Um, and it's not just a one single contaminant that's an issue. Um, we are dealing with uh, drugs, <laughs> literal drugs in the, uh, our waterways. You know, um, people flush medications down, people um, that are on medications. When you go to the bathroom, that medication is coming out of you and going into the water sources. Um, tires, we recently discovered that uh, when you're driving on the road, your tires are shedding this really toxic dust that is particularly deadly to salmon, especially coho salmon. Um, but that's a very new discovery just in the last couple of years. Uh, there's chemicals that are used in toilet paper uh, that were just a couple of weeks ago found to be um, in very high levels in Southern resident killer whales. So 
it's just a huge, huge problem. You know, we live in a very urban area and all of this stuff uh, is, is making its way into the habitat of Southern residents. Uh, and then in addition to pollution, another thing that gets talked about quite a lot um, as contributing to Southern resident killer whale health status is disturbance. And um, Southern residents, again, as you probably know, hunt using echolocation. So basically they're making these clicks from their melon, the clicks are going out into their watery world and they're bouncing back and letting the whales know where you know, that fish is. And so when you've got a lot of vessel traffic, a lot of underwater noise, that can interfere with their ability to forage and communicate. But one of the things, and quite a lot of studies have been done on this, um, one of the things that we now know is that it is the speed of the boat that determines how much sound it's generating. So the sound on the vessels for the most part is coming from the propeller. So as that propeller turns, it's making all these little bubbles. And every time those tiny little bubbles pop, we call it cavitation, that's what's making that underwater noise. And so if you are moving slow, that propeller is moving slow, you're not generating as many of those bubbles compared to if it's moving really fast and you're having a lot of those bubbles popping, which is much louder. And so it is the speed that your vessel is traveling that is really, really important, way, way more important than the actual distance you are from the whales is speed. Um, and that's something that we don't talk about quite uh, enough, in my opinion, but we really need to slow the vessels down. It also helps in general um, for reducing the risk of ship strike, which is something that I know when I lived and worked in California, we talked quite a lot about reducing ship strike down there, especially off the Channel Islands by slowing ships down. Well, guess what? The good news is that a slow ship is also a much quieter ship. So we should be slowing down for multiple reasons. Uh, and so what are we doing? <laughs> so great, we know problem. Uh, we know why they're in this situation, but what's being done to fix it? Uh, I'm going to talk specifically about actions that are being taken in Washington. Um, here in this area, um, we are transboundary organizations. So we have whale watching companies in Washington and British Columbia, the Southern residents, don't recognize international boundaries. They're in both countries. But the truth is Canada is undertaking quite a lot of the same measures. Um, but you know, you are, I'm guessing most of you that are watching this talk tonight, probably US citizens. And so when you're voting, um, you know, you're voting for measures that are taking place in the United States. So that's what I'm gonna focus on today, but just know that Canada is taking very similar measures north of the border. So one of the things that Washington is doing is they have set up um, an orca recovery office and they have a government website dedicated to orca recovery, orca.wa.gov. And on this website, there's lots of information about all of the different steps that are being taken to address those issues of prey, issues of disturbance and pollution, as well as uh, you know how successful those measures are so far. And so um, these are just some of the highlights of what's been done in the last couple of years. It is not all inclusive. These are just some of the kind of big ticket items. There's dozens of things that have been done in recent years. Um, so starting with the prey, uh, one of the things that Washington has really done a lot of in the last couple of years is increasing investment in salmon and forage fish habitat restoration. In my opinion, this is, gosh, if not number one, it's certainly tied for number one as far as the most important thing that needs to happen because salmon and the forage fish that those salmon feed on um, lost a lot of their habitat to dams, to culverts, to bridges that um, impede their uh, you know, movement back into the streams where they need to spawn. And so now Washington is kind of in a position where we're realizing that a lot of mistakes were made when that infrastructure was built. And now they're tearing that infrastructure out or they're modifying that infrastructure to make sure that fish are able to safely navigate around it or through it. Um, so that's one big thing. Um, increasing hatchery production. So uh, if you're not familiar with hatcheries, it's quite complicated. I'm not even an expert on this myself, but um, basically they are taking you know, wild fish, raising them in a captive setting, and then they release them to help bolster the number of overall salmon that are out there. Um, I have in parentheses that this is a Band-Aid solution. Ideally, eventually we're going to have more wild salmon 
but that is a kind of long-term goal. And so in the interim, um, there's a lot more emphasis on getting more of these kind of hatchery salmon um, that, that are raised and reared with human assistance out there into the environment to help feed not just southern resident killer whales, but there's a lot of other animals that need salmon to survive. Um, reducing salmon bycatch. Um, so there's been a lot of reduction just on fishing quotas in general, but um, also uh, kind of cracking down on how many salmon are accidentally caught um, in the process. And then one that I want to make sure I put on your radar is um, the state is really gung-ho right now about um, starting to implement lethal management of pinnipeds, which is a really nice way of saying um, they want to start a call again. Um, if you're not familiar with the history of this, back in you know the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, even 60s, uh, fishermen viewed pinnipeds, seals and sea lions as competition. They were out there you know eating their fish. And so Washington State put a bounty on seals and sea lions, go out, shoot them, you get five bucks a head. And that dramatically decreased the population of pinnipeds. Um, it's thought that there were uh, maybe only as few as about 3,000 harbor seals left in the whole state of Washington um, by the time those culls ended in the 1960s. So since 1972, when the Marine Mammal Protection Act went into place, harbor seals have had a chance to recover, sea lions have had a chance to recover, and right now they're back to the levels that they were before those culls happened. If you listen to some sources, they say that the population is exploding and it's just out of control. That's not true. They're comparing to what it was during a time that people were out there removing them at an unsustainable rate. The number now is not more than it should be, right? Um, but what is true is that there are more pinnipeds now and that means more competition for the very, very few salmon that we have left. And so it is a problem, um, but I certainly disagree that the problem will be solved by removing pinnipeds. Um, one, pinnipeds eat a very small percentage of salmon. Only about 3% of a seal diet is Chinook salmon. Um, they eat a lot more, uh, almost about 25% uh, of a fish called hake, which is a salmon predator. So think about that for a second. If we remove the predators of a salmon predator, then we're making more salmon predators. So I don't like it for that reason. The other reason I don't like it is we just talked about how great the big killer whales are doing now that seals and sea lions have recovered. And so what happens if we start removing seals and sea lions? Now we might have two types of killer whales that don't have enough food in the sailor sea. So I say this just again, to put it on your radar, it hasn't happened yet. But it is not just a kind of crazy idea that's been throwing out. Um, WDFW is very much supportive of this. And I wouldn't be surprised if it doesn't start in the next year or two. So you'll probably hear me. Or if you follow me on social media, you'll see me very loudly probably speaking out against this. Um, but stay tuned. Um, it's something that I don't personally want to see happen. OK, rant over. Uh, moving on, uh, pollution. Um, there's a lot of things going on about pollution as well. So uh, one of them is just identifying what chemicals are the most hazardous to southern resident killer whales. I mentioned we just made that huge discovery about the toxic tire dust that's killing salmon. Um, and so they've reached out to tire manufacturers to try to get them to change their manufacturing practices. So one of the important things is just figuring out what are the most hazardous chemicals. Um, also, increasing monitoring for toxic substances. Seems like a no-brainer, but we need to be regularly checking and monitoring um, our water quality to make sure that there's nothing out there that shouldn't be. Um, and then also reducing stormwater threats and making sure that we're accelerating cleanup uh, when we do know that there's toxicants in the water. And then when it comes to disturbance, um, as a professional whale watcher, this is the one that kind of touches my life the most, um, there have been a lot of new speed and distance regulations implemented. And um, on a federal level, they're looking at revisiting the federal rules as well. Um, there's also a program called Quiet Sound that was just started here in Washington State that is aiming to get large vessel traffic to voluntarily slow down in places where southern resident killer whales are known to be at the times they're known to be there. Um, I mentioned that down south, you have the ship slowdowns in the Channel Islands. Um, that, again, was meant to reduce ship strike, but we're kind of doing the same thing up here 
hoping that it will quiet the waters and allow southern resident killer whales to forage more effectively. So that just went into place um, this past winter was the first pilot season, but that's a program that we hope will continue. And then also um, just making sure that there's more enforcement for the vessel regulations. Um, you know, and again, you can appreciate this in California because I used to work on the water down there. There's not a lot of enforcement presence um, at all. Uh, when we're out on the water as whale watchers, um, we monitor how often we see law enforcement vessels there when we're partaking in a whale watching encounter, and it's less than 2% of the time. Um, and you can imagine that if there's whales, usually whale watch vessels are there. So if they're not there with us, um, you know, how often are they really out there patrolling? Um, and that's something that we're working with law enforcement to try to see if we can increase their efficiency, help them know where they need to be, when they need to be there, so they can help enforce these regulations. Um, and let's talk about what those regulations are. And this, I think, will be of particular interest to you, since I know a lot of you down there are boat-based naturalists or other whale watching crew members. Um, this was the biggest shock to me when I moved from San Diego up to Washington State. Our rules are very different. So I wanted to share these with you. I think you'll uh, appreciate them. Uh, so when it comes to most whales, things like humpback whales, gray whales, minke whales, our rules are the same as you. It's a hundred yard recommendation um, from most whales. And that is the federal rule, that Marine Mammal Protection Act, a hundred yard recommendation from most whale species. But then beyond that, we have a 200 yard law um, from Biggs killer whales. So there is a federal law that in Washington state specifically, um, you have to stay 200 yards from all killer whales. I wrote Biggs killer whales because Southern residents have their own rules, but any killer whale that you find in inland Washington waters, you have to stay 200 yards away. And that rule was designed because they did not believe that the general public could tell the difference. So it's not that Biggs killer whales need, you know, that extra protection. It's that Southern resident killer whales need that extra protection. And so they just made kind of one blanket rule. Now that rule went into place in 2011. But in 2019, Washington state decided to up the ante and they changed the rule to 300 yards for Southern resident killer whales specifically. So 300 yards on the sides of Southern residents and 400 yards in front of or behind. And that is a Washington state law. Here's the kicker. In 2021, Washington state made another law that said professional whale watch boats can't approach closer than one nautical mile, which is more than 1,000 yards. That is professional whale watch vessels only. It does not apply to any other type of vessel. So as of right now in Washington state, if you're out on your buddy's boat, you can watch Southern residents from 300. Professional whale watch vessels have to stay more than 1,000 yards, which if you're a whale watcher, you know, that's pretty darn far and basically means we can't watch Southern residents anymore. There is a seven knot speed limit here in Washington state, which states that if you are within one half nautical mile of Southern resident killer whales, you have to slow down to seven knots or less. That rule does apply to all vessels. That rule applies to recreational vessels as well. On the other side of the border, it's very similar. It's hundred meters from most whale species, 200 meters for any whale that's resting or if they have a calf, um, 400 meters from all orcas, so big killer whales, northern residents, southern residents, but professional whale watch vessels can sign a special agreement with the government of Canada to still watch big killer whales from 200 so that it would be the same as in Washington. But again, we have to promise that we will not watch southern resident killer whales from any distance whatsoever. And so before our meeting started tonight, I was talking to a few of the board members who said they've come up here to Washington to watch Southern resident killer whales, would love to come up again. And guess what folks, I do not think that we will be able to watch Southern resident killer whales from a whale watch vessel ever again in my lifetime. Um, so if you've had that experience, consider yourselves lucky. Um, unfortunately, we're just not able to do that anymore. Um, but one of the interesting things is that so much attention has gone onto increasing these viewing distances. That's not really having much return on the investment. Um, if you look at this, this is a graph of the Southern resident killer whale population since 2005 when they became an endangered population. And you can see kind of the transformation from 100 yards to 
200 yards to 300 yards to the current distance, which is a thousand yards for whale watch boats. Yet the number keeps going down and down and down, almost as if this wasn't really making a difference for Southern resident killer whales. And that might be because the loudest vessels in the Sailor Sea are exempt from all of these rules. Um, this is a 2016 study that was published that examined regional um, contributors of underwater noise in the Salish Sea. And if you look at the pie chart here, you will see that almost 70% of the underwater noise in this region is generated by ferries. We have lots and lots of ferries in both Washington State and British Columbia, and they are exempt from both the speed limits restrictions as well as the distance regulations. So if they come across whales, they are under no obligation whatsoever to slow down or to divert course. Now, we do have relationships with a lot of these ferries. We'll talk to the captains over the radio if we know that there's whales there. A lot of them will acknowledge that and they may change course or slow down, but the truth is they don't have to and they don't always. Um, so this is one frustration for us. Um, also tankers and merchant ships contribute about another quarter of the underwater sound along with the tugs that escort them. And so combined, commercial shipping and ferries are contributing about 93% of the underwater sound and they are totally exempt from the distance and speed restrictions. By comparison, whale watch vessels generate 0.6% of the underwater noise. Yet we are the only vessels right now that in both countries are not allowed to be anywhere near Southern resident killer whales. Uh, another thing that's interesting and again frustrating for us as whale watchers is that we have been removed from this situation, but other vessels, including recreational boats, are allowed to view southern resident killer whales anytime they like. Um, and this is problematic because normally when you'd have a professional whale watch vessel there, we can mark the location of the whales, we can mark the distance that you're supposed to be maintaining. We have range finders, we have radar on board. Um, and we can warn boaters in advance that there's whales nearby. Removing us from the equation puts the whales, in our opinion, and now in the opinion of peer-reviewed science, um, at risk. Uh, there was a really great study that came out last year from uh, Monica Whelan Shields of the Orca Behavior Institute. Um, they spent time observing whale watch vessels and whales from both shore as well as from research boats. And what they found is that when whale watching boats were there, on scene to again help mark the location of the whales, the number of dangerous recreational boating incidents around those killer whales, both southern resident killer whales and big killer whales, uh, was less than half of the number when there was not a whale watching boat there. So when there were no whale watch boats around the whales, there were about 6.6 .6 dangerous boating incidents around the whales per hour. And when you had at least one whale watch boat there watching the whales, that reduced down to 2.65 incidents per hour. So in our opinion, again, being there and helping to educate boaters about how to properly act around whales, um, we think is a service to the whales that we're watching. And it's a service that we're not able to provide any longer to Southern resident killer whales because the restrictions have excluded only commercial whale watch vessels. Uh, so that's kind of our situation up here, which is quite complex. It's some of the things that we're doing in this region. Um, but what can you do, right? I live in California. How the heck am I supposed to help these whales that are all the way up there? Um, well, you can, and it's important that you do because Southern resident killer whales are California whales too. Um, in 2021, NOAA expanded Southern resident killer whale critical habitat beyond the Salish Sea all the way south to Point Sur, California. So if you look at this map here, you can see the light blue area up in the Salish Sea is what the critical habitat used to be before 2021. And now that we have a much better understanding of Southern resident killer behavior, we know that they're going all the way down towards Monterey Bay and even a little bit farther south. So we really need to change the way that we think about Southern residents and their habitat. Um, I mentioned earlier that we were transitioning to calling them big killer whales instead of transient killer whales because transient kind of gave the impression that they were very rarely seen when in fact they're seen very often. The same thing really applies to residents. A lot of people hear resident and assume 
hell. They just live in the San Juan Islands all the time. That could not be farther from the truth. They spend a lot of time out in the open ocean. In fact, probably a lot more time than they spend on these inland Washington and BC waters. Uh, and they do travel, as I mentioned, far south to um, take advantage of salmon runs down in Northern California, as well as Central Valley of California. Uh, rivers like the Klamath and the Sacramento uh, were historically very important to them. We know that K and L pod spends the most uh, time, that's supposed to be most, but it says pose instead, uh, most time in California waters. Um, and they're typically down there in the winter. So January through March. Um, we know that not just from sightings, and some whale watch companies have seen them down there in the winter months, but unfortunately we also know it because if you take samples from them, uh, blubber samples, for example, or fecal samples, and analyze them for toxicants, uh, the K and L pod members are really, really high in something that's known as the California signature, um, which are toxins, mainly DDTs, that were really heavily used by California's agriculture industry. Um, they were banned in the 1970s, but uh, they're so pervasive. Once they're in the environment, they're really there. You know, every time it rains, they're getting washed into the ocean and things like that. And so um, we know that those two pods are the most exposed to those chemicals. Um, J-Pod, who spends a lot more time up north, is a lot higher in PBDE type chemicals. Um, just because that's what we have a lot more of here in the Seattle area. Um, but unfortunately, the Sacramento River has pretty much totally collapsed when it comes to salmon. Um, this graphic was made a couple of years ago. I think they still list some parts of the Klamath as good. Um, unfortunately, the Klamath is also really tanking lately. So um, they need better fish returns from those two rivers. And that's where you folks who live in California uh, can start to um, you know, kind of champion a change down there. Um, so what can you do? Let's start with um, some of the easy ones. So reduce your carbon footprint. And I know this seems very generic. You always hear about this, but it really is something that we have to start doing. Um, and specifically how it pertains to salmon and southern resident killer whales is that drought prevents salmon from returning to their natal streams and rivers to spawn. They can't swim up a river that is dry, right? And so they need to have water there. And that's something that became very evident during the droughts that we've had over the last few years and all of the wildfires. Um, rising ocean temperatures is also a really big issue. Um, salmon survival decreases if the temperature gets above about 58 degrees. So, um, you know, they really want cold, nutrient rich water. And if it gets too warm, they are not able to reproduce successfully, their survival rate goes down. So, they need cold, cold water. And so what you can do is reduce your personal carbon footprint, whatever that looks like to you, whether it's you know walking instead of driving, uh, carpooling, switching to an electric vehicle, things like that. Um, but we really need to start making that change for many, many reasons, but for this reason especially. Uh, this one, next one, shop locally when possible. I'm so guilty of not following this one. Um, I live on an island, it's not easy to get all the things that I want, it's so, so simple to just click and buy something on Amazon, but I have to get better because these things are being shipped by air, they're being shipped by big freighters, you know, there's a lot of things that are traveling internationally. I have to start um, buying things that are, you know, locally made and um, sold whenever possible, and I encourage you to do the same. And then also, especially important down there in California, be mindful of your water consumption. Down there, you deal with drought much more than I do here in very rainy Washington, um, but, but that is something that you, we really need to keep in mind. Uh, next topic, um, eat sustainable seafood. And this is a, a bit of a hot button issue, but um, I'm just gonna you know, tell you like it is. Uh, do not buy farmed salmon, just don't do it. Um, it is harmful for you and it is harmful for the environment. A lot of people purchase farmed salmon because they know that a lot of wild salmon runs are in trouble and they figure, well, I'm not going to eat wild salmon because that's bad. I'll eat farmed salmon instead. That way I'm not taking any wild salmon out of the ocean. But the problem is farms are really, really problematic. And I don't even have enough time to go into why during this talk. So I'll just mention you know, things like parasites, uh, harmful chemicals. They are um, Atlantic salmon that are being farmed in the Pacific Ocean. And so we have escapements where they're getting out 
and then they become competitors for the wild salmon. Um, you know, they're, they're filthy. There's a lot of problems with the waste going into the environment. They take food that uh, would belong to wild salmon and grind it up to make pellets to feed these farm salmon. So there's just so many problems. So um, do not buy farm salmon. If you ever see Atlantic salmon on the menu, that is farmed salmon. If you ever go to a grocery store and buy, you know, a $6 sushi roll um, with salmon, trust me, that's not going to be wild salmon. So um, I, I really just, in general, I stay away from salmon. Um, but moving on to the next thing, do not buy salmon if you don't know exactly how it was caught and what stock it belongs to. And the truth is, it's almost impossible for average consumers to know that information, which means I personally just don't eat any salmon unless, you know, a friend physically caught it on their boats and I know them or something like that. But um, there's just too many variables uh, and, and we just really don't want to risk it. Um, one thing that was so eye-opening for me when I started following this issue that I hope is eye-opening for you as well is just like with farm salmon and people buying farm salmon because they don't want to take from these endangered populations of salmon, is a lot of people say, oh, well, I buy Alaskan caught salmon. And Alaska does a great job of marketing this as being the sustainable choice. But now that we understand more about the life history of salmon, 97% of salmon that are caught in Alaska are not from Alaska. They are from British Columbia, they are from Washington, they are from Oregon, they are from California, and they just travel up to Alaska before they travel back down. And so catching Alaskan salmon is no longer a safe bet. And the reason I said this is a hot topic is because I don't want to vilify fishermen. They've been doing this for decades, it's what they know, but we now have a better understanding of how salmon work. Um, and so we just have to do better. Um, so yeah, if you're gonna be consuming seafood, I personally steer clear of salmon, but if you love, 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 love salmon, you're, you're gonna have to uh, you know, figure out exactly where it's sourced and, and just avoid farm salmon and even Alaskan salmon is, is really problematic. Uh, next up is cutting the chemicals. So uh, we wanna keep those chemicals out of the water. They're a huge problem for not just killer whales, but all marine life. Um, and so transition from toxic chemicals to more, you know, natural cleaning products and yard products. Um, there is this little logo from the EPA. They put it on products that are um, a better choice. So look for that in your stores. Um, do not wash your car in your driveway. And I can't remember if this is actually a rule in Southern California or not. I know when we were in San Diego in a drought, we weren't allowed to do this, but um, don't do that because you're just washing a bunch of chemicals. Um, down into eventually the watershed. Um, and if you find leaks, so if your car is parked and you know you have this big oil slick underneath your car, you have to take care of that right away. You can't let that leach into um, the groundwater. Um, and then also don't flush your unwanted medication. Um, so if you do have any medication that you don't want, don't flush it down the toilet. That is also gonna end up in the ocean. Um, you can take it to your local pharmacy and they will dispose of it properly. Uh, and then restore habitat. This is, in my opinion, one of the biggest things that we can do. Um, where I live in Washington, obviously, because I'm very close to the source, um, it, it might have a little bit more of an impact. But down in California, there are still projects you can contribute to. Um, and even if you're in Southern California, you can at least um, financially support restoration projects in Northern California and Central California or you can legislatively support them. And so if there is a ballot measure, for example, um, for California as a state that has to deal with you know, funding restoration projects or habitat protection or things like that, um, just make sure that you vote for those protections as California residents, which I'm assuming a lot of you are if you're attending this talk. Um, plant trees and remove invasive vegetation. Uh, again, just like reducing carbon footprint, this seems like such a, you know, throwaway tip, but it's what we need. We really need so much more um, of those trees for a, a variety of reasons, but we have to address the climate change issue. So um, there's lots of opportunities for you to do tree plantings in your area. Um, I looked up in anticipation of this talk, just a few groups in Orange County that do this, um, Newport Bay Conservancy, OC Parks, um, 
you can go to their websites and look for volunteer opportunities and they do tree plantings and beach cleanups and restoration projects all the time. So that's a great thing that you can do that might not directly help salmon, but it helps the world. <laughs> and so eventually that helps salmon too. Uh, I do just wanna, before we switch to questions here, um, give you some reasons for hope. Um, anyone who's been following Southern Resident Killer Whales for a very long time uh, is probably pretty, uh, you know, fatigued. <laughs> it's a really depressing thing, just like the folks that study, you know, vaquitas down in Baja. Uh, just every year the news is bad and bad and bad and bad, and there's very little stuff to celebrate. And so I wanted to leave you with three kind of positives that are happening for the Southern Resident Killer Whales right now. One is that there are two new calves who were born to the population in 2022. Um, one of them was J59, who was born in February 2022, and the other is K45, who was born in May of 2022. K45 is the first calf born to K-Pod since 2011. It was 11 years since the last successful birth to that pod. So that was a huge deal. Um, and as far as we know, you know, we don't see K-Pod uh, very often, but as far as we know, that calf is still doing well. Um, and the other good news is that both of those calves have been confirmed by researchers to be females. And um, obviously any calf is welcome and something to celebrate, but females are the ones that are going to go on to have more calves in their lifetime. And so the fact that those are two females, um, that, that's a really big thing to celebrate. So that's our kind of first bit of good news. Second bit um, is that last year was kind of encouraging. J-Pod um, spent a lot more time in the Sailor Sea last year than they have over the last several years. Um, so if you look at this graphic, again, from Orca Behavior Institute, you can see um, K-Pod and L-Pod really don't spend as much time in the Salish Sea, usually about 40, maybe 50 days a year. But last year, J-Pod had a huge spike in presence. Um, they were here uh, about 160 days out of the year, we presume. So um, why? <laughs> we think it has to do with an increase in salmon um, and particularly chum salmon. So um, chum salmon are not Chinook. They're not those really big fatty salmon that they like, but there's lots of them, especially in the fall and winter time. And the number of chum salmon in Puget Sound last fall was double what the fisheries managers anticipated it would be. And in turn, we did see J-Pod here quite a lot in the fall and early winter months. So um, we're, we're hoping that there's some more fish out there and that some of those measures to protect fish and increase fish abundance are in fact working. And then final bit of hopeful news is from California. Um, so the Federal uh, Regulatory, uh, sorry, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission recently approved the removal of four dams along the Klamath River. Um, and this removal would be the largest dam removal project in the world. And it would reopen 400 miles, which you can see um, kind of here in pink. Um, 400 miles of salmon habitat that has not been accessible to them. Um, I am going to knock on wood right now because until the dams are actually gone, uh, you know, politics, something could happen. Uh, you know, there could be last minute injunctions and all of that nonsense. But if this goes according to plan, um, deconstruction for this project will begin in 2024. And again, this is a huge deal. Um, it's the biggest type of dam removal project that has been approved. And one of the things that I thought was really interesting is that NOAA um, shared this on their social media as kind of a victory. Um, and if anyone's been following this situation for a long time, uh, I think that for quite a while, we've been kind of frustrated that NOAA wasn't doing more about salmon. And the fact that they shared um, the removal of a dam as being a victory for salmon recovery um, kind of, to me, signaled a little bit of a change. So that was really um, encouraging to me. Uh, if you are interested in learning more about Southern Resident Killer Whales and what you can do to help, um, there are many organizations working on this, but the four that I recommend um, right off the bat are Orca Behavior Institute, Wild Orca Center for Whale Research, and Orca Network. And with that, we are done. <laughs> so we've still got lots and lots of time for questions. Um, and uh, if you want to and I come back, I'll stop sharing my screen and we can just talk face to face.
All right, thanks so much, Erin. So we have some questions for you in um, the Q&A and in the chat. Um, there have been some coming in during your lecture and I'm sure there'll be more as people are putting their questions in. Are you able to see both of those or would you like me to read out questions for you? Um, I can see the questions. So I'll start with the Q&A first. You think right. that's good? Okay. Um, so first question comes from Joe <laughs> and he says, are killer whales actually hunting moose now? Um, and I will chuckle because I know exactly what he's talking about. And there is, uh, yes, one record from Alaska of um, transient or big killer whales up in Alaska going after a moose. Um, but it is only just that one record. I don't think it's really, you know, a big thing. But, um, but yes, it has happened at least once in the past, never around my area. We don't have moose down here, but it did happen once in Alaska. Um, and Joe also had a question about salmon blockage still causing problems. I'm assuming we're talking about things like, uh, you know, the dams and culverts and bridges and things like that that I did touch on. So yes, it is a problem and it is something that we are working to fix. Um, Katie says, I'm familiar with Salish Sea resources. Can you recommend any resources in Canada regarding public hydrophones and tracking of orca sightings? Um, yeah, so I talked a lot about Washington, but BC has some similar resources. Um, if you are looking for hydrophones on the Washington side, Orca Sound is what you're going to look for, that hydrophone network. In Canada, um, a lot of their hydrophones, unfortunately, are not publicly available, but in the Gulf Islands, um, Saturna Island, I believe, is the East Point hydrophone, recently has been made public. So I'm not sure exactly what to Google to find it. But um, if you look up, yeah, Gulf Islands or um, East Point Hydrophone, um, you should be able to find a hydrophone for um, the Canadian side of the border. Um, and then as far as tracking orca sightings, um, you know, Orca Network is pretty good about their reports, which cover um, quite a lot of the Salish Sea. Uh, Chris, uh, Christy asks, do the two new babies up the southern resident population from 73 to 75, or are they included in the 73? Unfortunately, they are included in the 73. Um, so that brought the total to 73. Um, and then, uh, oh, sorry, the other question was just, can you show the slide of the different ORCA organizations? Unfortunately, I already stopped sharing my screen. But um, I'll just repeat them again, which is Orca Network, uh, Orca Behavior Institute, Center for Whale Research, and Wild Orca. Those are the four that I would recommend um, that you check out. Um, so that is the Q&A. And then I don't know if you've been monitoring chat. <laughs> if you have a question, um, you can put another question in the Q&A, or else I can go back through the chat and see if there were any questions in there. We do definitely have questions for you in the chat as well. They're kind of mixed in with comments, but if you want to scroll through, you'll see a few in there too. Okay. All right. I'm sc scrolling up, scrolling up. Um, let's see. Uh, Oh, awesome. I will just say we have a we have a celebrity guest, <laughs> in my opinion, at least, um, which is Dr. Deborah Giles. She's my fish lady. Um, she is with Wild Orca, which is one of the organizations I recommended. Um, but she just gave some clarifying information about um, the Chinook. So as I mentioned, the size of Chinook is getting smaller and smaller. And she wrote in the chat that the average size of Chinook in Puget Sound right now is 12 and a half pounds. Um, so that is uh, much smaller than it was historically. Uh, let's see, just um, why is the rule in place for professional whale watchers? Um, so I've talked a lot about how the regulations right now exclude whale watching vessels from watching Southern residents, but not other vessels. And um, the honest truth is because we are kind of a professional organization and we're a small group of vessels, it's easy to regulate us, right? Whereas there are tens of thousands of recreational vessels out there on the water. And so, so far up to this point, they have not had the authority, um, and I'm talking about on both sides of the border, um, they've not had the authority to regulate non-whale watching vessels. Um, I will tell you, um, just because it's something that's happening right now, 
there is currently a bill in Washington state that would move to change the distance for Southern resident killer whales only from the 300 yards for recreational vessels to the thousand yards, which is the distance for whale watch vessels. Um, and so obviously we would uh, think that that makes sense because it doesn't make any sense that the trained professionals are three times farther away than untrained boaters. Um, so that is uh, currently going through the Washington state legislative session right now. Um, I'm told it has kind of a fair amount of support, but we're not sure. So um, we, we'll see how that goes, but um, there is a, a push to kind of remedy that disparity and make the distance a thousand yards for all boaters. Um, now, ferries and cargo ships would still be exempt. So those I don't think will ever change, um, but at least it would apply to recreational vessels as well. Uh, all right, still just chatting. And if anyone thinks of any other questions, in the meantime, feel free to ask. I'm just catching up on some of the comments. Dennis Kelly asked, is transient orca populations increase or populations of porpoise and seals decreasing? Really good question. So that is what it stands to reason, right? So as, as they're eating them, um, and there was a really good paper that came out in 2018 from Orca Behavior Institute estimating how many seals, you know, this big population needs to eat every single year. Um, and what they found is that if you use just kind of the bare minimum formula of, you know, how many calories you need to live, um, that they are taking at least a thousand seals a year. Um, I know that I personally eat a lot more than I need to live. Uh, and so the big killer whales probably are too. Um, and the other really cool thing about that is that that paper was based on 2017 numbers. Since then, the population has increased by at least about 40 animals and their presence has doubled. So in 2017, there were only about 600 sightings of big killer whales. And in 2022, as I mentioned, there were more than 1,200. So that number of 1,000 really should be assumed to be the absolute bare, bare minimum. So uh, we only started seeing big killer whales in this area in pretty big numbers in like 2016, 2017. So I think we still just need a little bit of time to let them catch up. But yes, it is my hope that um, they will be the solution to this problem and that people don't have to get involved because the more humans try to manipulate ecosystems, the worse it usually is. You know, They were able to figure it out long before we were here. Um, and uh, and I, I just think that there's a lot at stake um, if that calling solution, you know, doesn't work. So I, I don't want them to even chance it, quite, quite honestly. All right. I think that's all the chat questions that I can see. I'll do one. Uh, oh, let me see. Okay. Larry had one about fishing quotas. Um, and I actually do not know um, what's the fishing quota for Chinook in Washington. Um, I have a lot on my plate, Larry, so I can't talk about all of this stuff, but um, I can tell you because um, I have quite a lot of friends who are fishers, um, some that are commercial fishers, um, but a lot more that are recreational fishers. Ah, trying not to get myself in trouble here, but just like it's really easy to regulate commercial whale watching as opposed to recreational vessels, I think it's been really easy to regulate recreational fishers as opposed to commercial fishers. And so the recreational fishers who are out there taking one fish a year, and I'm not exaggerating as far as I know, that's the Chinook, the wild Chinook rec uh, quota, um, it is very different than you know the commercial trawlers that are out there taking heaps and heaps of salmon. And Giles would appreciate this because we just talked about it the other day. But when I told you that cargo ships and ferries are exempt from all those distance and speed regulations about Southern residents, commercial salmon vessels are also exempt, which means you can have Southern resident killer whales feeding on salmon and then a commercial salmon trawler come and scoop up all those salmon. So I don't know the quota, but I would say that um, there's definitely been reductions and I hear about it quite a lot. 
And I'm not sure if the reductions are kind of proportionate to the effects that those reductions would have. And I'll kind of leave it at that. <laughs> uh, um, let's see, Gaina says, is hate consumed by humans? Um, I think some, but uh, I honestly don't know. I've never had it. Um, I don't know if there's a commercial fishery for it in this area, um, but uh, I am I am not sure. So I cannot answer that question. And we do have a few more questions in the Q&A now, if you'd like to check that out. Oh. A few okay. more come in. Perfect. Um, is there any way for us to make comments to the WDFW about pin and peg calling? Um, do you happen to know if any nonprofits we can support that are trying to advocate against calls? Um, that's a really good question. Um, you're always certainly welcome to contact WFW if you want to write them um, letters just generically right now. Um, there's no call to action right now. Um, and a lot of us that are kind of, you know, whale advocates are, are busy working on some of these vessel related things right now. Um, when there is, and I know it's coming, I, like I said, I really confidently think it'll probably be in the next year or two. Um, I will make sure that the powers that be in your group know that so that they can kind of um, uh, share the word with your followers. But um, yeah, you can always contact them just with general information, but um, there's no specific um, agenda on the table right now. But they did last November, I think, release a report um, basically saying that uh, they won't know if it works until they try. So they may as well try. So <laughs> that's kind of where um, that's leaving right now, but it hasn't started yet. They would still need to get approval um, from uh, you know, NOAA and stuff like that because they would need to be exempt from uh, the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Um, any particular Southern resident killer whale individuals we're particularly worried about? And um, that's from Lee. Uh, so this is a tough one because I'm not allowed to see them. So I don't know from a uh, firsthand experience. Um, I can tell you that last year, based on kind of those drone images that um, SR3 collected, they listed uh, 12 whales as being in condition that was concerning. Um, and they made that distinction in June of last year. Um, I have spoken to researchers with other organizations, not SR3, who said that throughout the course of the season, um, some of those whales did look like they bulked up. So it could be an issue of kind of them coming in in the spring and being skinny, and then they were able to eat a little bit and put on some weight. Um, but like I said, I haven't seen any of them physically, but last year, 12 of the 73 were listed to be in what they would consider to be um, or body condition. Um, let's see, who's involved in classifying whale language? Ooh, that might be something I need Giles Lifeline for as far as who the best group um, is uh, who's working on language stuff right now. I'm not sure. Um, I'm really not involved in, in the vocalization stuff. Um, and then another really good question from Maxwell, do killer whales that reside in Washington's dorsal fins ever droop? Do they ever collapse and fall over? Um, that is something that comes up a lot when we talk about um, killer whales in captivity, because we see killer whales in captivity quite often have a collapsed dorsal fin. They spend a lot of time at the surface, um, whereas wild killer whales spend a lot of time underwater, so they don't deal with the same gravity effects that whales that just kind of bob at the surface in a tank do. Um, that said, it is not impossible to have a wild killer whale that has a droopy fin if they're ever injured. Sometimes you'll see a fin curl over. Um, you know, maybe they were chasing a sea lion and they get bitten in the dorsal fin and it might collapse over. Um, some of the shark eating killer whales down in South Africa have um, really collapsed dorsals. I'm guessing again that they probably got some type of injury or something, but it's really, really rare to have a wild killer whale with a collapsed dorsal, whereas it is very, very common. In fact, I think it's like 100% of males um, in captivity have a grouped over dorsal fin. And we do have one more question in the chat as well from Molly, and this is really sort of regarding the next generation of cetacean researchers. Okay, let's see. Um, So basically saying that there's lots of enthusiasm for whale research and it's kind of intimidating um, entering the graduate world. Um, is there any 
area of research or cognitive research for orcas that you would encourage or recommend? Ah, Molly. <laughs> Um, so this is a really good question, and this is something that I talk about in our little whale community quite a bit, because those of us that are in the trenches, um, and like I said, are depressed almost all of the time, and I often wonder if I want to encourage people to enter this mess, right? It just gets to be really hard. Um, I will say that there are quite a lot of people working on this, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. And um, it's a pretty heavily saturated thing. I mentioned, I don't personally study orcas um, because there's a lot of other people that, that are already doing it. Um, there's probably a lot of people on this call that would appreciate help, but I'm not sure how many paid jobs there are <laughs> for orcas. Um, but there's lots of other whales that we know like virtually nothing about. So there's lots of other species, even outside cetaceans that, that really, need people to look at them. And in my opinion, a lot of people gravitate towards orcas, um, but, but you know, it, there's not very many opportunities. And I don't wanna say that to be discouraging, I just wanna be realistic. But those four groups that I mentioned, Orca Behavior Institute, Wild Orca, Center for Whale Research, Orca Network, those are the four that I would reach out to. Sometimes they have internships and things like that, um, but, but paid positions are, are pretty hard to come by up here for killer whale specifically. Now that I've crushed those dreams, <laughs> okay. but 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 we need people to care, and, and I, I don't want to um, I don't want to uh, discourage people. But um, like I said, sometimes I wonder if I would have known how hard this would be and how discouraging it would be, and um, kind of how how sad it is to learn how politics really work. Um, I don't know that I would have necessarily gone into this. And again, I know people that are on this call have, have dealt with that before. And, and that's sometimes really frustrating, but, but someone has to be optimistic and, and it's not always me. So I'm glad that you're willing to carry the torch. All right, well, if you have any last questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat um, or in the Q and A. Otherwise we are gonna be wrapping up for the evening. Cool. Yeah. And um, thank you again so much for, for having me. Um, like I said, this is a topic that um, I really think needs to get out there. I do um, think that we need to really reconsider the way that we think about Southern residents and they are not Washington whales. You know, they're Oregon whales, they're California whales, and you as Californians should embrace that Southern residents, um, their critical habitat comes down into your state. So I think that if we start talking about them as West Coast whales, as opposed to just, um, you know, Washington killer whales, that there might be a lot more emphasis on their recovery all up and down their range. Agreed. Well, thank you so much. I know one of the other things that you could check out is that Seafood Watch, which tells you about which fish are sustainable and which ones you should be avoiding. Um, so that's really good, Monterey Bay has put that out there and it is the canary in the coal mine and, and I, it is hard to have hope. And I know there's that Jane Goodall quote about, you know, seeing the whole world as a jigsaw puzzle and it's overwhelming and terrifying to, if you think of all the problems and it, it's hard to get out of bed some days, but if you just realize that everybody is in their own little corner of the world working on their little part, you know, that's the, that's the part that sustains you and, and, and hope is still alive. Um, so, um, yeah. So, and people protect what they love and for some reason everybody's loved orcas and it's you know because of the captive industry that um, brought our attention to it and it hasn't really helped them a lot so hopefully 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 um, something will happen in the very near future to make sure that these guys are still here um, thank you so much for all of your you know non-expert expertise information um, that you provided for us tonight your absolute um, treasure as much as the um, southern resident killer whales and this will be recorded and will be on our website um, in the near future so you'll be able to get a recap and and watch it over and over and over and over again Okay, thank you all for attending and we'll see you next month for Belugas. How fantastic is that? Okay, thank you everybody. Have oh, a great- Awesome, time. thank you so much for everybody's attendance. All right, bye. Bye.